On Sunday, February 7, 2021, Art House Productions hosted a panel discussion to accompany our radio play, Black Tom Island. Martin Casella's play tells the story of an immigrant family caught up in a plot to sabotage munitions during World War I. This podcast will include excerpts from the Zoom panel, which explored the actual events of the historic Black Tom explosion in 1916, as well as behind-the-scenes stories from the radio play's production. The panel was moderated by Jim Peskin of the Art House Board of Trustees and an educator at Save the Ellis Island Foundation. Let's go now to Jim Peskin. Hi, thanks for joining us on this lovely snowy afternoon. It's a great day to be indoors. Janet Akershenis is an interpreter at Liberty State Park. Interpreters know the story of the places that they work. And so, Janet, could you just kind of fill us in? What is Black Tom? Where is it? What is it? Okay, so Black Tom was an island that was about 1,200 feet from the shore of Jersey City. So the original coastline is basically where the turnpike is now. So all of the land that is Liberty State Park, which is about 1,200 acres, is all landfill or what they call historic fill now. And so Black Tom was an island. It's now kind of incorporated in the southernmost end of the park. And it was about a 20 acre island that was connected to the mainland by a railroad trestle. In the late 1800s or early 1900s, there was a, a, just a railroad trestle that connected the island to the mainland. It got its name. It's kind of uh, fuzzy, the history about that. There's kind of two schools of thought. One is that the original land looked like a a tomcat with its back up. I kind of don't see that, but the other theory is that, or the other school of thought is that there was a uh, a dark-skinned man, either a Native American, perhaps African-American or a a dark-skinned farmer that farmed the land. So it was a silt-rich island that was farmed. And if you're out in the sun, you're gonna have dark skin. So perhaps that's how it got its name, Black Tom. So that's the folklore around the name of it. But right now um, there is some physical evidence of the outline of the original island. If you go to Liberty State Park, You'll see a jetty that juts out that is from the island itself. Mars Pesson Drive is the original causeway that connected the island to the mainland, but now it's all fill. John Beekman is the librarian in the New Jersey room at the Jersey City Public Library. John, can you share a bit about the history of Black Tom Island? Uh, You know, anytime you get five historians together, you're going to have seven opinions. So I will (laughs) jump in a little bit as to the prehistory of Black Tom. The earliest reference I've been able to find to it is from 1837, when it was really just an outcropping of rocks uh, in Communipaw Cove, which, you know, at the time of European uh, settlement was uh, oyster beds. A Black Tom Reef is referred to in a deed that Aaron Ogden had to some of that land as a landmark there. Um, So it doesn't really become an island proper until uh, cement mining up upriver starts to silt in Communipaw Cove in the mid 19th century and uh, the, the, uh, these outcroppings sort of become an island. The earliest mention that I find of uh, Black Tom as a person is from the 1880s. Um, so I, I suppose I'm more of the school of, uh, of the Tom Cat though. I don't really find any reference to that, but it was, you know, it was an outcropping of rock before it was an island and then yeah, it was then the island was expanded. There was a nitroglycerin factory there in the 1870s, which blew up in the late 1870s, establishing a long history of things blowing up there. Uh, <laughs> and then there was the, uh, it was acquired by the National Ware- uh, Warehouse Company and developed by the Lehigh Railroad into, a, into an isthmus by the turn of the century. Uh, Jersey City, was really defined by the railroads uh, throughout the late 19th century. Uh, first downtown, the New Jersey Railroad, which was became the Pennsylvania Railroad into what's now the Exchange Place area. The Central Railroad was developed, uh, developed the former Communipaw Cove. Um, 
Charles Sisson bought up all the land along the waterfront for the Central Railroad, which gave them the right to continue filling in and making land uh, what, the, what the cement mining had started, the railroads finished um, and became an industrial and rail port. Um, all of Jersey City's waterfront was rail yards by the turn of the into the 20th century. And, you know, I'll maybe stop there having set the stage. And if Tim wants to talk a little bit about the event itself. Dr. Timothy R. White is a professor at New Jersey City University. Tim, can you tell us about the explosion on July 30th, 1916? Absolutely. Uh, I get to do the fun part, the uh, <laughs> fireworks, so to speak. 2.08 a.m. is generally what people uh, cite as the beginning. And there's a famous minute four minutes later when the clock in Journal Square got hit, uh, stopping the hands at 2.12 a.m. Uh, and that, for some, I think shows the, the distance, the reach of the debris. But if you think about the reach of the uh, the the shaking people in Philadelphia reporting uh, physical uh, awareness of what had, had gone on the windows in 44th Street and the Times Square area being blown out. Um, so the the explosion itself uh, was dramatic visually, um, auditorily, and of course in in feeling you feeling that rattle. Um, so this was, I think very well captured in, in the radio play. And one thing I was quite pleased at is the way that the wife had willed herself not to read any newspaper accounts and had blocked out the details. And it forced the hand of, of the Pinkerton to rattle off the details. Uh, and so there was this great exposition happening and I was waiting for details because these are, these are the details that have cemented that event within many people's imagination, and especially in Jersey City. But boy, oh boy, the infant knocked from the crib, uh, the explosions happening over several hours, um, measuring on the Richter scale, the windows of, of Times Square and the lights, the, the sky being ablaze with orange light. Uh, it really is shocking to me how big this must have been. To hear the explosion begin and then continue, I think was one of the most authentic and, and powerful moments because by all accounts, it kept going on and on and on. And you can only imagine how terrifying this would be to not only hear and feel the explosion and then to have it continue. That night, I don't think anybody got much sleep. It's truly shocking. I have a, a little anecdote. We, we do tours at Ellis Island and we tell the story. And I had a guy who grew up in Bayonne who showed up and he said, oh yeah, his um, mother or grandmother was living in Bayonne the night of the explosion. And she said that everyone who lived in Bayonne ran out into the streets, got down on their hands and knees and prayed because they thought it was the end of the world. So that, I mean, uh, that, really, that's, that really demonstrates what you were talking about. Let's turn to Dr. Libby O'Connell the Chief Historian Emeritus for the History Channel. Libby, this event occurred on July 30th, 1916, about a year and a half before the United States would wind up joining World War I. Can you describe where we were politically at this time and what might have led to this incident? America at the time was supposedly neutral in World War I, but it was leaning towards the, what we would call today, the Allies, Britain and, and France and, and Russia at the time. A year before, April 1915, one German sub had torpedoed a big Atlantic ship crossing with lots of civilians. It's called the Lusitania. Many Americans were on board, including my great-grandmother. Many of them died. And that really started pushing people toward the Allies. They were trying to remain neutral, but there was a lot of anti-German sentiment. Also, though, there were a lot of German-American immigrants. And there was a strong pro-German feeling in the country. And also right down the middle of the road, let's just stay neutral, stop choosing sides. This explosion was another event, not as powerful as the Lusitania, didn't get as much national press, but it was a very big event in America. And it was tied to German sabotage. They didn't have actually as much proof as we have today that in fact, there were German intelligence workers who'd been sent over from Germany who were trying to destroy ammunition in this country so that it couldn't be sent to England, France, or Russia. 
the British were blockading Germany, eliminating trade to Germany. Even though Germany had once been buying arms and munitions from us, we were an equal opportunity arms broker in the beginning of World War I. When the blockade by the British started, the only people we could sell to were the British and the French. The Germans felt that's not being neutral. And so they sent Germans over to sabotage the arms and the munitions that were being made in America so they would not end up in Britain. An important aspect, if you look at the amount of sabotage that was going on, was that very few lives were lost. They timed when they would blow things up so that there were not workers there, but they were determined to explode as much of the black powder they could get. And when Black Tom exploded, there's a big barge with a 100,000 pounds of TNT on board. It was one of the largest explosions, non-nuclear explosions in the history of the world, the Black Tom explosion. It was huge. And that story, the people in Bayonne thinking it's the second, you know, the end of the world. Apparently the security guards in the, in the Woolworth built, building were all down on their hands and knees thinking it was the second coming of Christ. Um, so people were really scared by this. And it's just actually amazing that they were using these, what they're called cigar bombs that were invented in Germany that had a timing device internally. And it was timed so that they knew most of the Germans knew that most of the people would be outside of that Black Tom area so that you had the fewest lives lost. Let's go back to John here, being from Jersey City. How did this affect the culture of Jersey City? I mean, does Jersey City have a, a German immigrant population? What, what was the, uh, the social impact of the event? You know, I'm looking at this in one respect. I mean, an explosion on the waterfront was not all that unusual for Jersey City. I mean, as early as, as 1866, as uh, there was a huge petroleum explosion. And you see like in the 19th century papers like Frank Leslie or things like that, there's every 10, 15 years, there'll be a news event of huge explosion on the Jersey City waterfront. And even in 1911, uh, at Communipaw, not far uh, from, uh, from Black Tom, there was a, a gigantic dynamite explosion that Again, if you look in some of the stories, similar things being said, you know, felt as far away as Philadelphia. Uh, for Black Tom, people were saying as far away as, as Baltimore, but, uh, you know, but still. So in a way, uh, this was not an unusual event. Uh, and of course, as it turns out, uh, as it was later discovered to be an act of sabotage, uh, something which came out as World War II was gearing up and became part of the, the, the drive to push people to um, join World War II. But locally, uh, to me, I think probably the most immediate significance was the, its role in the career of a young ambitious politician who was just coming on the scene by the name of Frank Haig, uh, who would come to dominate Jersey City's history uh, in the first half of the 20th century, and to some degree to this day. Uh, he had just been, uh, elected to the commission, the Jersey City government was restructured to a commission form of government and he was elected to that body in 1913 and given control of public safety, which was the police and fire departments. And he set himself up as a reformer, uh, really professionalizing the police force um, and creating his own little private band of police, uh, which would become significant later. But he was known as a reformer, uh, uh, really professionalizing the police and fire. And this event in 1916 really gave him an opportunity to show off these, these forces and their response to that. And also about control of Jersey City's waterfront uh, between the, the, the railroad companies on one hand and the, the federal government on the other hand, the Interstate Commerce Commission, which, which controlled freight traffic, uh, but then once it got to the docks, it was city, the city's responsibility, but then the railroads had a lot of power in Jersey City at that time. So Frank Haig sort of set himself up as a, an advocate for Jersey City against the, against the feds and against the railroad companies, you know, uh, after the explosion, he he forbids all explosives to come into Jersey City. They sets up blockades of Jersey City, stopping all explosive freight from coming in. 
uh, go so far as to arrest four executives, uh, two from the National Docks Company and one from the Lehigh Railroad, uh, arrest them, charges them with manslaughter. Just the very, these things play out in the press, uh, really raising his profile as, as an efficient politician. And he is elected to the mayoralty in 1917, you know, the next year, and doesn't look back for the next 30 years. I think the local significance in the career of Frank Haig is something that's less known or was perhaps less known when people started to look at this, you know, after 2000, uh, after 9-11. I think the Black Tom was sort of lesser known. I get the sense, you know, it would be remembered every anniversary or so, 10 years, 40 years, whatever. But it was after 9-11 that I think scholarly interest or public, uh, public history interest really came back to look at Black Tom and say, hey, there was this previous, you know, uh, act of terrorism, as it came to be known, um, the right there across the river from the World Trade Center. Uh, Tim, let's include you in on this as well. I also saw an interesting question or two in the chat about uh, what was known at the time and how well this was widely known in the United States at the time. Was it the 9-11 for that generation? And I think there's a, a, a few things driving this to not be. Uh, one is technology. Uh, this was not filmed. There was no footage. And because of the live footage of 9-11, there is just no escaping the, the impact, the significance, the ongoing replays of the horrifying events of planes flying into towers. This was in the middle of the night. It was photographed in the aftermath, but it was not captured through the technology that would make it a, an, an event of national consciousness. The other thing, and thank you to uh, Dr. O'Connell's uh, contributions about the, the global context, the, the wartime context, there was not only ignorance of the event outside of Jersey City or outside of New Jersey, but perhaps uh, quite a few disincentives by powerful political leaders, media leaders. If you send this out over the Associated Press, if you put this in every newspaper across the United States, you're basically stepping us one foot closer to war. And so that I think is a fascinating uh, context and helps us to understand how people did not know more about this at the time, given how huge the explosion was. Libby, can you expand on this? One thing that's an interesting fact about the World Trade Center Black Tom situation is that the Black Tom explosion was much bigger than the World Trade explosion on a huge magnitude. But it's the, the loss of life, I think, that makes it particularly a dramatic contrast. You're absolutely right, though. The Wilson administration did not want to go to war yet. Right? They were trying desperately to sit on the fence, but they recognized the fact that American big business and banks were lending huge sums. JP Morgan was lending huge sums to the allies so that they could buy our munitions. Lots of people in America were making a lot of money on this and they really did not want that munition trade to the allies to be threatened. At the same time, they didn't want that awareness of, wow, this does seem like we're favoring the allies over the central powers, Germany and um, its allies. It was a time when the government had a lot more control over the press than it does today. And that would only increase, of course, when we declared war. Another thing, though, is that they weren't able to indict anybody, right? So they didn't know who did it. They talk about, I mean, they indicted people, but they weren't able to really arrest and jail the people who were, in fact, responsible. And that becomes a source of frustration for this sort of proto secret service that we have and the Bureau of Information, which was not yet the Federal Bureau of Information. The federal government didn't really have a sense of how to, they didn't have the organizations to keep track of saboteurs and espionage going on inside the United States at the time. Oh, interesting. Also German Americans in the United States at that time as an immigration group was highly respected. And rightly so. Mm -hmm especially in New York society. When the German immigrants came here, they were a little different kind of a group than other Eastern Europeans or Southern Europeans or even uh, Irish when they came. Yes. So they, they were, had a, a very uh, prominent role in New York society. And like you said, they were a very big financial um, group 
that was highly respected. And even in Jersey City, if you look in Jersey City itself, there's a lot of German uh, American yeah. influence within Jersey City itself. And Woodrow Wilson said this was an unfortunate event at a, a private munitions depot. He really wanted to downplay it because he wanted to remain neutral. Remember that when the Germans arrived, you had Catholics, Protestants, and Jewish Germans. They got to marry everybody. So you don't have this big religious you know, prejudice against Germans because they were very successfully intermarried into the population that's existed. And they are literate and everybody lo loved beer gardens. They were very popular. They came with skills, they were in cultural society, the opera. For those of us in the theater, the German theater was really one of the most important uh, cultural institutions in New York, both in English and in German. Now, I'd like to shift directions a little bit and speak with uh, playwright Martin Casella. Martin, I want to just kind of ask you a couple of questions about the play itself. Where did you find the story? I lived in Jersey City for five years during the last uh, decade. And uh, I attended church uh, at the Catholic Church, which is Our Lady of Chechnohova, which is the painting that they talk about, Black Madonna painting. The church is named after that, which is right near the waterfront. And one day I was wandering around up near the front of the church, and I came across a panel of stained glass windows that were donated by a neighborhood family. And there was something in Polish written at the bottom. I sort of recognized it as Polish. And we had a priest there at the time who spoke Polish. He was, he was uh, his family were immigrants, but uh, he was born in America. And I said to him, what, what does this say? I'm kind of fascinated by this. And he said, it, the translation was this, this stained glass window is dedicated to the memory of those who died in the explosion of 1916. And I so turned to him and I said, what, what was that? And he says, oh, you're going to have to go Google that. I don't know. He, he honestly didn't know about the explosion. <laughs> and so I went home and Googled and found this incredible story about what happened. And I sort of became a little obsessed with it for a couple of weeks. And then two weeks after that, my agent called me out of the blue and said, there's a commission from a local New Jersey theater company, Premier Stages. They're looking for stories about little known events, historical events in New Jersey. Uh, they have a competition every two years to write a play about this. Do you have any ideas? Do you have any ideas at all? And I said, do I have an idea? <laughs> yes, yes, I just saw this amazing stained glass window and there's a spectacular story behind it. And the more I researched it, the more interesting it became to me. And especially when I got to the part about, I believe his name was Richard, I forget what the actual guy who was accused of doing it. And um, he was a Slovakian immigrant. And, um, and I, and, I changed a little of the details. He didn't have a wife in the real case, but when I got to the point of the historical documents that he lived in a boarding house and his, the, his landlady, apparently, according to this, this, this history, the landlady found him the next morning after the explosion sitting in his sitting room with, a, with stuff all over his face. And he was sobbing with his hands in his hands saying, what have I done? What have I done? What have I done? And according to the lore that I found, I, I, as your, John, I think it was your remark earlier about ask five historians and you get seven different points of view. But um, the story that I found said that the landlady was the one who actually took him to the police department and said, you have to turn yourself in. And Janet, you were. You were yeah, she, it was his aunt. His aunt. That's what it was. So I thought, well, the aunt is a good person, but I think I'm going to take a little artistic license here and make it a wife. And the reason I did that was because the day I was writing the proposal for the contest, I had the TV on and two weeks before that, someone had tried to blow up the 23rd street in Manhattan, the 23rd street path train station, which obviously most everybody here knows and anybody that's listening outside of the area, that's the basically underground subway train that is specifically dedicated to go over to New Jersey. And um, someone had tried to blow the the station up. Nobody was, some people were injured, but nobody was killed. And that afternoon, while I was writing up the, uh, the proposal and uh, I had the TV on and in the background, the local news station had the father of the young man who had been arrested. And he, they came from a Middle Eastern family and the father was sobbing while the news reporter was interviewing him saying, 
Um, my son was a good boy. He came from America. Um, he loves America. But two years ago, he went to visit relatives. I think it was Afghanistan. And uh, he said he came back and he was different. And he said in the interview while he was crying, I called the FBI and told them. I called the police and told them no one did anything about it. And, and my son, I know my son did this. He admitted it. I mean, it was amazing in the interview. And I heard that and I thought that's the way into the story. The story of the wife, like instead of the aunt, I said, I'm going to give him a wife who's pregnant. That makes her a little more vulnerable. They're immigrants who came from Slovakia as he was in real life. Um, and, uh, I thought that's the way in because I wanted to tell it from the wife's point of view of what do I do when I think this man I love, we came here, he, we sacrificed everything to come here. And he may have done this, you know, first she thinks it's a terrible thing that he's going to do. And then later on, she realizes what okay. his involvement, that it was actually her husband that did this. So I took a little creative license in that, but that's how I found the story. And that's how I ended up, I ended up writing it. And I, my, I, I, strangely enough, I said, I want to tell it from the woman's point of view. I want to tell it from the wife. And I, one of my favorite films ever is a movie, old movie called Gaslight with Ingrid Bergman, where she's sort of slowly being driven insane by her crazy husband. And I thought, I want to write a role for a woman that's that extensive, that's that powerful. It has a lot of range. So that's how, that's how it came to be written. Apparently, the historians can uh, tell me if this is true or not. It, it was in the research I found that certain members of the Lehigh Valley Railroad were arrested at the time because they had not paid that $25 fee that, or $50 fee that they had to pay to keep all those explosives on the island overnight. So I took that and I came up with, oh, Pinkerton. That's interesting because New Jersey and Phil and Pitts, uh, Pennsylvania have a long history of Pinkertons and the Molly Maguires. And I thought, oh, that'll bring a new sort of nice piece to it. And then because of the kindness of the priests at uh, the at OLC, Our Lady of Chechenhova that I went to and being Catholic and, and I thought, wow, well, what if we have, uh, because the premier stages was interested, it was, I won the contest in 19, uh, 2016, life sort of changed in 2016 for many political reasons. And I really wanted to focus on the immigrant story. I thought that was really important at the time. And basically while I was writing it, you know, we had marches and protests all over the country about keeping people out of our country and, and what was going on. So that, and, and the young man in the real life man in the story who was from Slovakia, he did work at a, uh, a plant uh, that that had been on strike at the time, and that's how he ended up getting the job as a night watchman. He took a second job while the place where he worked was on strike. Hmm. I for, I'm forgetting oil. It was the oil company. His name was Michael Kristoff. Yes, the real and, the real and immigrant. He worked in um, at the Eagle Iron Works, which was across the causeway from Black Tom. Mm -hmm. So apparently, he walked across the causeway you know, security wasn't like what security is today. When you say they had security guards, it was nothing like the security yeah. today. And people could walk back and forth. Yeah. And, and so he was, uh, um, from what I read, a, a familiar person. So nobody questioned when he walked across, but there were two other, other Germans who were um, also implicated in this sabotage. And I wanna also talk about that. I saw some questions coming up about terrorism and sabotage there this was considered there is a difference between terrorism and sabotage and terrorists want you to know who they are and they want their cause to be um, highlighted and they want to do the most physical uh, uh, damage and personal damage they want they that's what a terrorist is sabotage they want to do damage but they don't want you to know who did it they want to cause a problem but they want to be kept secret. So that's kind of the difference between sabotage and terrorism. And what happened on Black Tom was truly sabotage. They didn't want to be, um, you know, outed. They didn't say who it was. It was a secret. But later, the Germans who were involved, uh, the higher ups, the ones who recruited them, wrote books about the, the yes. issue. I mean, they, mm -hmm. so, yeah. so we know who the people were. They were also involved in many other explosions with which um, Libby can, I'm sure, talk about that. But and they also created these pencil bombs. They were yes. they worked as chemists, so 
there was, uh, it's very interesting how it was, how it all, um, you know, corresponds, but there was definitely sabotage. Sabotage. And Janet, the interesting thing is that the, there was a whole case about this and Germany paid reparations up until yeah. only what, 20 or 30 years ago, they paid 1979, 1979, right. the German government paid reparations for that explosion and yeah. all the damage that was caused. 93 million. Yeah. Dollars. Yeah, ninety a lot, and and yeah. for any for the people listening, um, the the extent of the damage I believe at the time was in nineteen sixteen money it was about two million dollars, which now is almost half a billion dollars worth of damage. Just the damage from all the broken glass mm -hmm. was somewhere in the in in tens tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, the Statue of Liberty said that they had four hundred thousand dollars worth of damage in nineteen sixteen. In nineteen sixteen, yeah. yeah, that's why that's the why theory. which we deal with in the play we we deal with it in the play about her the the, the lamp. But most people, visitors can't go up there anymore and haven't been able to for 100 years. I kind of dispel, this is a huge rumor that I want to dispel about the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty, the torch, was never really open to the public ever. That's right. It, it is a, a very, very <laughs> steep ladder, very poorly lit to go to the torch of the Statue of Liberty. Very few people have ever gone up there. Yeah. Anybody can go up to the, the crown, yeah. but the torch itself was never meant for public viewing. And there, there, prior to 1986, when they did the huge renovation of the Statue of Liberty, there, there's this, this theory that the explosion did damage to the arm. Right, that's what I've heard. When so. yeah. they did the, the engineering report, which was done by both the French and American engineers of the Statue of Liberty, they, they found that when the the arm, the torch arm was erected, it wasn't erected properly. So from That's the very beginning, <laughs> that, that yeah. arm was never strong enough mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, of course withstand that kind of an explosion, but it was, it wasn't, the damage wasn't done because of the explosion. It was never properly erected, you know, put together properly. According to the engineering, oh, the Eiffel was the engineer. That's absolutely right. Thank you for thank you for just that's telling. fantastic to know that. In the play, he only says it was damaged. We never uh, also on Ellis Island, the the roof of the of the main building came in. Uh, the, hospital, came in. the hospital, yeah, the hospital, the hospital building, right? And the front, yeah. I've seen photos of these huge door, like metal doors that were actually blown open on yeah. the at the base of the part Statue of, of Liberty. I'm sure the other historians here join me in this. It is so great when somebody takes an historical moment and makes it into a work of art that can be appreciated outside academics and outside history books, because it opens the tent for mm -hmm. people to want to learn more. So thank you. I'd like to engage Darren Lee, director of the podcast. This was written to be a full production. Uh, what was the experience like translating the work into a radio play? Well, what was um, sort of interesting for me is that I came to the project later. I was not I was not part of the live production. So I, I was actually sort of approaching the material, I think, similar to the way that a lot of the listeners would approach the material. And so I was presented with the adaptation that, that Martin so brilliantly did for the radio. And then I was able to listen to these wonderful actors that I believe either had been part of the live production or the reading. We had Eva, played by Jenna Krasowski, Martin Mason Hensley, Macmillan, Michael Stewart Allen, and Prosco Damon Rosario. And so Marty has this really amazing ability to take this huge historical event, I actually had the benefit of working with him on another play where he did something very similar, and turn it into something that has an incredible amount of humanity. And these actors did the same thing. And so what I did is basically similar to what we're doing now, it was sort of a Zoom they would be recording the actual audio while we're watching them over Zoom. And then we would go back and have review notes and try to pick up what, what we thought was going to translate the best in just an audio format. It was actually very interesting. After a while, we started to just turn off cameras because we wanted to have the same experience that the audience was going to have. Something that when you think about a live production, of course, you have lighting, you have scenic, you have sound, you have all sorts of other things. Um, we had a brilliant sound designer, Megumi Katayama. And so she basically, as a director for me, was my only resource. And so I was able to deal with sort of tempo, 
volume, you know, and special effects. And now with a little bit more technology, you're able to have a certain amount of surround and direction. It's actually interesting, something that Tim was talking about earlier, this idea of, of the explosion going on and on and on. In the original draft, that, that particular sequence did not exist. And so it was something that, it was this circular conversation about how do we have mm -hmm. the audience be able to experience this event as if it's happening to them for the first time, even though Macmillan is describing it for Eva for the first time. And so it was this idea that we were going to have the event audio playing as if, as if it's a memory, but it's impacting her and bringing the play to this culmination. And so that's just a small example of something that you would take, you know, sort of on stage in a large production value and make it into something that the audience can experience and have sort of a similar event happen in their minds. When Darren, when Darren suggested, suggested that, that, we all just lit up. When he said, no, I want to hear it. I want to hear it. When McMillan's describing exactly what happened, I want to hear it. And we just, we were like, we were virtually high-fiving each other at that point. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, just a few more minutes. I'd like to have some, some responses from the scholars. I work at Ellis Island for the same reason that you wrote the play. Immigration has been under attack. What I'm curious about is what are the what are the implications? What does this play say, or what can it do specifically about immigration? I guess, Libby, you mentioned a little bit of it. We are a nation of immigrants. We are we are our country is built on immigration. To turn your back on that, to, you know, to, and to pull up the the ramp is yeah. runs contrary. But there has been this conflict in America th throughout every generation says, oh, not that group. Certainly in the 19th century, you saw that against the Irish and you see it in preceding generations, but Statue of Liberty is there for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> and one um, reason is yeah. to welcome people to America. Just I'm curious about from Jersey City's perspective, at our house, we have all these figures that Jersey City is not if the most diverse city in yeah. the United States or, or one of them. Um, how does this play relate to Jersey City today? What are your thoughts about that? I was really struck in the in the play where the wife says, you know, in English, you know, speak English. And there's this really, you know, effort about like fitting in because the play is that right at the time of the, the height of the progressive era, despite what we think of the term today, was was very much uh, sort of conflicted about how to deal with immigrants. And there was a question of Americanization. It wasn't, you know, the, uh, the glorious mosaic really wasn't the way that people thought about immigrants necessarily. Um, and there was a great deal of ethnic conflict. And we talk about Frank Haig, who came out of the Irish political machine and certainly understood local politics in terms of ethnic blocs. Uh, he was sort of fighting against the more established Germans, uh, you know, the, who were sort of the well, better off communities. And then as time progressed and more, you know, Italian and Central European immigrant groups came in and the, around the turn of the century, he would incorporate them into the machine, but never really fully trusting them to be, you know, as American and as his sort of political outlook curdled in the, uh, into the 1930s, he would really use that Americanization as a, as, a, as a wedge issue. And I think, you know, the way we think about immigrants today and the discourse, you know, as a, you know, what it is to be an American, you know, what that means, whether Americanization means conforming into a sort of Anglo-German culture or, you know, maintaining an ethnic identity is, is a tension that exists uh, and that we really need to face head on, you know, rather than just celebrate someone's ethnic cooking day or something. It's a real conflict right at the core of American identity. And I think that this play touches on that issue really nicely and it does resonate today. Jersey City has always been, you know, we are the closest city to Ellis Island, you know, despite what our neighbors across the river might think, you know, uh, we are the immigrant city, Jersey City. And, uh, you know, that, that has always been a microcosm of the country. And uh, I think that is remains true, even in this era where, you know, we're in what Nancy Foner calls the JFK era of immigration. We're not at the, uh, you know, we're not at the Ellis Island era of immigration, but now we're in the, the, the international airport era, but it's still the same thing, you know, of, of what does it mean to be an American? You know, uh, that, that's an open question. In the first few drafts of the play, Inspector McMillan was also an immigrant. He was an Irish immigrant. 
And I did that for on purpose because of that really odd connection that's in some historical references that it was uh, an Irish group mm -hmm. that I can't pronounce it, that the there there is historical sort Clan of- Miguel. Clan yeah, Miguel. The, the Clan Nagel, that they were also somehow involved with the explosion. And the, the original director said, this is turning into the Meryl Streep accent contest. We have to have one of the four people not having an accent. So that went away. But he still has that speech at the end, which feeds into this when he said, the British have been killing my people for hundreds of years. Very interesting about that, because many of the German sailors the, the German ships were in, in New York Harbor and in New Jersey in the harbor, and they could not, they were like, uh, they couldn't leave. They were, you know, stuck here. So a lot of those, those sailors were hanging out at the bars in Jersey City with the Irish sailors who were very <laughs> unhappy with the United States and Britain. Yes, so they, yeah. That's also <laughs> a part of the story of Black Tom. And they're watching these ships come in, these British and French ships come in and be allowed to purchase arms and yet they were not able to participate. So of course there was this seething, you know, undercurrent. And so it was ripe for sabotage. There's also one more point I really want to mention about the Statue of Liberty. We talk about the Statue of Liberty being an immigrant, you know, welcoming the immigrants. But one of the main reasons the Statue of Liberty was gifted to the United States was to celebrate the abolition of slavery. And we miss that all the time. And that is very, very important, especially in today's culture, which we're talking about how to bring up, you know, immigration today and how, how we're standing. In terms of history, it's very important to note that the Statue of Liberty was a gift to the United States to also celebrate the abolition of slavery. Very important. Jim, I have a question for the historians. Is that okay? How do scholars and historians feel about taking real life stories and fictionalizing them? I added that character of the wife because I wanted to, to make the focus, which I sometimes would have to explain in talkbacks. Well, she didn't really exist. It was his aunt in real life. There's other examples of taking real stories and sticking like half real people and then half um, fictionalized ones. I would love to know how the, the four of you feel about that. I'll jump in on this. And this relates to the previous topic we were discussing, what it all means, what's the significance. And I'd say adapting a, a real situation and adding some artistic license, some fictional uh, work to, to drive the story forward is great as long as the, the piece is, is helping to do the work. So I think of what's going on at Ellis Island, Liberty State Park, Jersey City Public Library, the History Channel, uh, New Jersey City University, where I get to teach. And all of us are, are doing the work. We're trying to uh, increase awareness and knowledge of how deep the roots are of these problems of discrimination and anti-immigrant sentiment. How many different groups of people have, have suffered from this types of uh, discrimination? So if the work, I, I used to sit in on this charming uh, live theater piece at Ellis Island uh, when I took tour groups. If it's, if it's doing something to advance uh, genuine understanding, I, I think it's welcomed and, and, and needed. Libby? I think there's a big line between a piece that presents itself as a documentary and you're going to learn the you know, actual details of this historic event and a work of art like a movie or a play or a podcast that presents itself as a work of art rather than an historical interpretation, right? Like there was a movie many, many years ago called The Patriot, which had a lot mm -hmm. of historic flaws. It was about a battle that takes place in, in, on a mountain called Kings Mountain. It's a national park. The people in the National Park said, I don't want to hear one more criticism about this movie. Yes, it had a lot of historical inventions, but nobody in America had ever heard of Kings Mountain. <laughs> and now they all come. And now we have so many visitors. And thank you for producing a movie. And even though there, we get to say, well, it was a good movie. And let me tell you where what really happened. But at least we have an audience. And a lot of Americans aren't studying history anymore. You know, they're, they're not getting it in school. They're not, most places they get it is at, from public historians, people at national parks, city historians, events like yours, this podcast is gonna open this story up to a lot more people. Your story makes a difference in how many people learn about these facts and understand the intersection between history and, and the immigration issues that we're facing today. Where does this come from? Why is, why is the past important in how we live our lives today? Thank you for listening. 
If you haven't done so already, we encourage you to listen to the first episode of this podcast, which is the radio play of Black Tom Island. Available for free on YouTube, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. If you enjoyed this program, please leave us a review and share it with others. Thank you again to our panelists, Dr. Libby O'Connell, Janet Actor Shanus, John Beekman, Dr. Timothy R. White, Martin Casella, Darren Lee, and moderator Jim Peskin. The Black Tom Island Radio Play and Historical Panel were made possible in part by the Hudson County History Partnership Program Grant. Art House Productions is supported by the New Jersey State Council on the Arts. I'm Art House's Producing Director, Courtney Little. Art House's staff includes Executive Director Meredith Burns, Theater Manager Miranda Dahl, and Gallery Director Andrea McKenna. Podcast editing and cover art were by American Octopus Productions. Special thanks to the Art House Productions Board of Trustees and to our interns, Domenica Dillon and Justin George. Art House Productions is a 501c3 nonprofit arts organization committed to the development and presentation of the performing and visual arts in Jersey City, New Jersey. Art House produces and presents theater, events, visual arts, arts education classes, and festivals, including Your Move, New Jersey's Modern Dance Festival, the Jersey City Comedy Festival, and JC Fridays. For more information about our programs or to make a donation, please visit our website at www.arthouseproductions.org.